welcome everyone also um, to this webinar. And um, um, yes, just seeing if I can still manage the screen. Also, thanks to OpenAir for hosting this webinar, and uh, uh, I'm, we are very delighted to be here. We're participating in both EOS Cup and OpenAir Advanced. We realize that there are already many services available for the researcher to make this data more fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and more open. But this webinar is not a webinar introducing all kinds of services of the two projects because there are simply too many of them. But we will highlight a few services that can be of help when you want to improve your data according to FAIR. Um, this one hour webinar is split into four parts. I will start with spending a few minutes uh, to quickly introduce EOSC and the two projects. Mayan will follow with introducing the concepts of FAIR and OPEN and the research lifecycle for the purpose of data management. And regarding services and the life cycle, as just mentioned, we will focus on the services that directly help researchers to put the FAIR data principles into practice. Now, we would like to answer your questions if you have them at the end of the webinar, but uh, you are welcome to ask them already in the chat area, of course. Um, and we and some other people from EOS Cup and OpenAir might be able to answer your questions on the fly during the webinar, but otherwise we will try to answer them at the end. So as mentioned already, the slides are already available. They will also appear on both project websites. And there you can also find information on their services and previous webinars and other support materials. Now, EOSC and EOSC building projects start with. EOSC is the European Open Science Cloud. The irony is that it will not only serve Europe, it does not only support open or open science, and it does not all have to happen in the cloud. It does bring together current and future data infrastructure, creating a shared area with all kinds of services to store analyze, document, link, and reuse data. This is all being done across borders, across scientific disciplines, and in this way facilitating improving science. So the, the name entails a little bit different things than uh, we thought it would be. There are other EOSC building projects at the moment, and um, then OpenAir and EOSC Hub that I should mention, I think, in that EOS Pilot, EOS Central, and FAIA. Well, let me now introduce shortly EOS Hub and Open Air Advanced. EOS Hub is all about integrating and managing the services that are offered by around 20 research in e infrastructures. In this way, building on previous work that is already being done within all kinds of projects. Uh, like EGI, EDOT, and Indigo, but also others. Now, EOS Cup is a Horizon 2020 program that started in January and will last for three years. As you can see on this slide, it's a huge project with many partners and people involved, and a large 30 million euro budget spread over all these partners. The main objective is to integrate and manage the services for EOS. Now, what is Open Air? Open Air Advance also started in January with a much smaller budget, but it is a continuation project since 2009. Open Air started as an open access infrastructure, and it is moving towards a more open science-oriented project. So implementing and aligning open science policies across Europe is definitely the first point on the list and harvesting all of the open access output, linking it to contextual information, such as research projects, institute information, or funding information. And logically, OpenAir is active in developing open standards and deploy services that researchers or research communities can use. In line with that, there is a training involved 
There is training involved for open science and fair science, which is often provided by the National Open Access Desk. So, open air is about opening, sharing, and reusing research outputs. Although the projects YouthHub and Open Air Advance are very different in focus, YouthHub being more about integrating and federation of storage, compute, and application services into EOS, and a large part of the integrated services that YouthHub offers is about big data analytics, big data computational services. Well, as Open Air is more about integrating uh, research data management and publication services into EOC and support is a training and consultancy. As these are very complementary, it has been decided to work closely, for example, on training and events like these. Now I would like to hand over to Ayam. Thank you, Ellen. And um, as well for me, welcome to this uh, joint webinar. Um, and actually, giving uh, a webinar like this is part of the uh, collaboration agreement between the two projects, EOS Cup and Open Air Advance, um, in the area of joint training and dissemination. Talking about open and fair data is also talking about um, a joint ambition. And let's start with this one. Um, you may have seen it. It's one of my favorite images. And one of the interpretations for this bird, I think, is um, a kind of old school um, researcher sitting on a mount of valuable data um, open to the whole world, but in our current context, um, yes, open, surely, um, but is it fair? Could you use the valuable objects that the bird collected so that you can reuse and benefit from them? Probably not. So open does not imply fair. And when we look at a more formal point of view, um, this is a slide made by Daniel Spichtinger from the European Commission uh, last year. And he explained about the shift taking place from open towards fair when he explained um, the European Commission's open research data pilot that pilot started, as the name says, with the ambition to make research data open. But gradually, the Commission endorsed the FAIR principles. And um, as Daniel Spichtinger wrote in his slide, the Commission now sees openness as one component of FAIR data and aims to address all of the FAIR aspects in Horizon 2020. In this context, it's good to be uh, aware that FAIR doesn't imply open either. Um, because it's perfectly OK when you have sensitive data to restrict access to those data to certain persons or organizations. Of course, you have to be explicit about this uh, in the grant proposal, preferably, or at the latest in your data management plan. And if you do that, um, your restricted access still count as accessible, even if the data cannot be made open to the whole world. I'm pretty sure that all 200 of you have seen the data principles, have thought about it, maybe have tried to implement them or have succeeded in implementing them. The links on the slide refer both to the, uh, the bullet list of all the principles and to the underlying uh, article in uh, the Nature Scientific Data publication. Um, but principles are principles, as the name says. And how could we come from um, principles to practice. What the European Commission does um, is provide some guidance on that, but it's very generic. So you are probably familiar with the guidance on data management planning that Horizon 2020 provides. And in that information, they literally say that the DMP template is inspired by FAIR as a general concept. And the conclusion you can draw from that is, OK, it's up to us to um, translate the principles into our practice. And hopefully, there is already some practice within the discipline or the domain we're working. Um, 
that is uh, a top-down approach, you could say. And there is also uh, a bottom-up one called the Go Fair Initiative um, that started in Europe with a couple of, um, let's say, early mover European member states making optimal use of initiatives and infrastructures that already exist. And it's interesting to note that Go Fair aims for fair data and services. Um, so that it goes a bit beyond um, the data themselves. Okay, this slide you see an example of top-down support, bottom-up support. But what does it mean for the daily life of a researcher? Let's take a look at some research life cycles and consider when it makes sense to think about fair. The first example I'd like to show you um, is, uh, comes from a paper about embedded network service research. So this is a very domain-specific approach. Um, you see, for instance, um, a reference to device calibration. Well, that's not for all of us. Um, and it makes sense, of course, to have a life cycle within a domain or a discipline. Um, and you see some clusters of activities for progress, processing and analyzing the data. Uh, and also for publishing both publications and data. Um, that is one example. Another example um, is a very nice and colorful one. This open access tube map, as they call it, um, indicates how open access to data and publication has many stakeholders. For the researcher, the route starts at the bottom in pink, where it says start here. And you can also see when you follow the pink route that only a small part, marked as data life cycle, um, is indeed about data. So the data life cycle um, is a section of the research life cycle, at least as it is indicated here. Recently, there was uh, the first webinar jointly presented and organized by Open Air and EOSCAP. And there, uh, Gergi Sipos presented this life cycle. This um, indicates the areas of phases for which the two projects deliver services. So for data management planning, finding and generating data sets, discovering services, and so on. So you can follow the whole route. Um, Interestingly, um, this is a counterclockwise approach. You don't see that very often, but of course, that's a matter of taste. Um, and it also indicates that there are uh, several roads towards the end, which is probably only fair. There is a question if the DECC um, is part of EOSC Hub. Uh, they are part of EOSC Pilots. Um, and uh, EOSC Hub, I leave it for others to answer. I'm not sure off the top of my mind. Um, moving on to the fourth sample life cycle is from the EOSC Hub project um, by itself. This is a very um, concise one. And this one is remarkable probably because the first step at the right-hand side um, is discover and reuse, which suggests that um, that should be the first thing we do. And I think that is a very interesting approach because when we talk about fair data, we often only consider making data fair, but not so much using fair data. So discover and reuse as a first step makes sense. However, um, in many domains, it is very um, common and, and standard to uh, generate and create your own data. So we think uh, the model shown here um, derives from the example of the UK Data Archive and already being used in um, a data management briefing paper um, in open air is the one we will use throughout this presentation. Okay, let's go back now to um, fairness. And this is the moment where I start with the second part of this presentation. It is the same life cycle, but um, backwards, because it makes sense to adopt the perspective of a future data user when you think about planning for fair. And um, this future data user could be yourself, of course. And the question then is, what would a reuser need? Um, how should the data be organized in terms of data, metadata, documentation, all this kind of contextual information? And when you are part of a large project, 
um, which has been going on for some years already, or a domain that already works in this way and shares a lot of data, it may be obvious. But for many researchers, it isn't clear from the start. And what is needed definitely is, and it's good that Sarah's in the room, um, a checklist that she started in the UDAT project, um, a checklist on to see how fair your data are. And one of the things this checklist said that uh, is that lots of documentation is needed. Okay, documentation to make your data fair. It all starts with metadata. That shouldn't be a surprise. Um, metadata like bibliographic information is needed to locate the data and to get a first impression of the content and the relevance for you. And we think that a persistent identifier like DOI is just part of metadata. There are generic metadata, Dublin Core, data site, and many disciplines also have um, discipline-specific um, metadata schemas. And it makes sense to um, check with the repository where you will store your data for the long term um, and that will preserve it for you because they often support or expect a certain metadata standard and they can help you. So if you're curious about what metadata exists in your discipline or related disciplines, there are a couple of rich sources. Fair sharing, for instance, is very rich and has a multidisciplinary collection of standards. Um, and it also provides some good guidance on why standards are useful. So if you need to convince someone else, this might be a good place to take a look. And um, the other sections, um, uh, the, R the RDA, the Research Data Alliance, and the Digital Curation Center uh, collaborate on meta standards overviews. You probably know the first uh, link. It has been uh, disseminated very widely. And I think the second link is especially interesting because that site also refers to tens of tools to create metadata or to validate metadata. Um, you see a short list, and it is longer on the website. Um, for instance, metadata in DDI schema, SDMX, linked data cubes, symplectic elements, pure and confarious. So lots of lots, uh, lots and lots of tools for metadata. In addition to metadata, um, there's documentation in the broader sense, and sometimes researchers. Um, tend to think that all the documentation that is needed is in the article. Um, probably not. Probably you would not include all the explanation of all the variables in your article, for instance. And of course, what um, the list that you see here uh, will not be relevant for everyone in each discipline. But it makes good sense that if you use a lab journal or a Jupyter notebook, for instance, to also share that with the others, um, because it explains a lot of how you worked and what you did at uh, particular moments during the process. In a similar way, it makes sense to uh, share and archive statistical queries, um, information about the machines and devices you used when you collected um, consent from respondents. That consent forms should be um, archived as well, and so on and so forth. So ideally, you would document and preserve everything that is needed to reproduce the study. My last slide on FAIR um, is about interoperability. Um, because that is often considered geeky and technical, um, but it need not be. Interoperability is what humans have been doing for ages. Um, you don't have to read the small print uh, on the slide, but words like consensus and standards helped us, of course, to come up with uh, shared notions for what is time and what is distance and how can we make sure that your piano um, um, is aligned with my piano. So it is about speaking the same language. And again, the degree of interoperability will clearly vary between disciplines and also within a discipline. Um, but Keep in mind that interoperability is an ambition and a goal for everyone to work towards. And then we reach a point where I hand over to Ellen again.
Yes, services at the point of need. And you look at the research data life cycle. Now, so what are the services at the point of need? First of all, both EOSC Hub and Open Air Advance already create and mention many services and support materials. So where do we start? It helps if you have known a little about the predecessors of these projects, like Open Air or EGDAT or EGI or Indigo, Indigo Data Cloud. For this webinar, we are looking for services for a researcher EOSC provides or will provide, and that improves the fairness of your data or project. So we have focused on common services and not services specific for your discipline. Although I understand you would be <laughs> would, uh, like to know what would what these services would be for your discipline. So here is a simplified life cycle with fair support. There are some services that can help researchers to put the fair data principles into practice. EOSCOP and OpenAIR have many more services to support the research process, as well as to support other stakeholders than researchers, such as funders and data providers. In your own research domain or research infrastructure, there may also be very relevant data services. So we are aware that we address just a small part of what will gradually become a huge open science cloud. So let's go around a little bit at the top. An example be to stage to transfer data from the EU CDI to high performance computing. And um, for analyzing, also very strong in EOS Cup is big data analytics, handling and creation. We have not focused on these big data services as they are quite new to us, but also because the compute services are more about analysis and less about improving FAIR or open the results, results, results. Now for giving access to data, there are some services that we will discuss as they really support improving FAIR and open science, such as Zenodo, b to share and b to note to plan uh, for fair and uh, good data management, we will discuss using uh, ECDMP or DMP online. And uh, there are several ways to know about the services that are available. Apart from the websites of your own research infrastructure, you will have the EOSC building website. And for the moment, we will also mention the marketplace. Now we'll shortly introduce some of these services that are shown here. Start with B to Find, making open science findable. B to Find is part of the EU CDI and is offering a central catalog of data. Here you can discover data that is shared by research infrastructures and communities with B to Find using metadata. You can use faceted search based on a harmonized set of metadata. There are more catalogs like this that support FAIR in making data findable and accessible, of course. The data of your infrastructure can, of course, also be harvested by B2Find, which is one of the examples of these kind of catalogs. Then B2Drop is the second service that uh, I want to highlight. It enables working collaboratively on the same files by a research project with several researchers in different institutes. Versioning is possible. But if you want to publish your data, you move your data date data from D to drop to B to share. Yeah, it's still in the slides. B to share is a way for researchers to store and share small scale research data from diverse contexts. B to share is a solution that facilitates research data storage guarantees long-term persistence of data and allows data, results, or ideas to be shared worldwide. B2Share, as I just mentioned, is integrated with B2Drop. So when you have stored files in B2Drop while you were still updating them during your research and now want to publish them, it is easy to publish with B2Share. You need to add some more metadata. Various domain-specific schemas uh, are supported. And B2Share makes, you, makes sure that the research outputs get sustainable, unique identifiers. 
this definitely makes them findable. Then I need to open the third presentation, yes. Because part of Share is a nice feature, the license selector. This very well supports your access policy and it's based on open source software. With the tool, you can select the appropriate license by answering a few questions which will finally suggest the right licenses covering your requirements. And the suggestion that it makes depends on, uh, amongst others, the type of the data you are depositing. Is it software or data? Uh, the original licenses of use software or data and the data consumer access and distribution rights that you want to allow. Now, when the data is published with V2Share, um, it already has metadata and the persistent unique identifier. But everyone, including the viewer, can add additional annotations to the data using the V2Node service. This service is integrated with V2Share, but can be integrated with other storage services. Of course, this improves the reusability and interoperability of the data. Can you adjust your mic? I'm not sure. This is better. No, not better. Not really. Ja, maar dat dat is niet handig. Um, so, we were talking about V2Node service that is integrated with V2Share. And um, when the data is uh, published with V2Share, you can use V2Node to annotate the data. I can't stop talking, <laughs> sorry. Of course, uh, the annotations improve the reusability and interoperability of the data. It's not only metadata is available for the data, but also semantic annotations. Now the marketplace is a completely different service, not linked to the EU.CDI. And uh, this is available through EDI at the moment, but will be part of EOSC, EOSC Hub. And service providers can add their services with conditions and research communities can look for a service they would like to have. For service providers, their services are better findable and EOSC Hub provides templates for service management. Now this does not really support fair data as for example other services of EOSC Hub do, such as online storage or the B2 services that we just mentioned. But it does support fair services and software, which is, we believe, just as important. The huge scope of services EOS will entail becomes even more clear now that Mayan will introduce some of the open air services. Okay, thank you again, Adam. Um, yes, I'll introduce some services from the uh, open air portfolio and I'll start with the Amnesia tool. Um, the slides are based on a recent webinar that was presented by uh, Manole Stadovitis and um, the idea of Amnesia, the goal of Amnesia is to make your personal data shareable and it refers to so-called micro data that could be data about your medical condition for instance. Um, and understandably, as an individual, you may be hesitant to uh, provide that data. And as a project or a company, you might be uh, afraid to share the data with experts. And um, the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, requires that you have a very strict protection scheme for that kind of data. Now, the idea in 
uh, anonymizing data is that the information that identifies an individual is removed from the data before you publish it so that no sensitive information can be attributed to uh, an individual. And when you look at uh, the image there, um, if you combine data sources and uh, the data in the sources has been anonymized, um, then it is no longer possible in that uh, particular situation to um, link the medical data to the social security number that is available in the other data set. So the idea is very simple. And the goal, of course, is that um, anonymization allows you to share um, the maximum amount of data without compromising the privacy of the individuals. And amnesia does not only remove direct identifiers, like your name or your social security, social security number, um, but it will also transform identifiers like your birth date and the zip code, um, like I said, so that individuals cannot be identified in the data. It is currently uh, a public beta version, um, so you can go there and um, play around with it. It is uh, available in two flavors. There is an online version, and that's mainly for demonstration and testing. Um, we provide some uh, sample data sets as well. Um, and you can uh, also download the application, and then you get more functionality in terms of uh, scale and security. Um, and please do give us, the colleagues behind the tool, feedback. Um, there are some plans, of course, for, all, for extension, adjusting it to health data in particular. Um, so we hope you will find it and find it um, useful and valuable. Jumping from A to Z, there is also Zenodo. Zenodo is way beyond a uh, beta version. Um, it is full production, and Zenodo is a repository for all output of EU-funded research. What you entrust to Zenodo is stored in the data center of CERN in Switzerland. Um, and Zenodo provides you with a persistent identifier for every upload. Um, it is free to use. Um, yes, there is a maximum upload amount, sensibly. Um, and it is open to all research outputs from, the dis from all disciplines. So that is a difference, for instance, with B2Share. While B2Share focuses on data, Zenodo doesn't have that kind of focus. Um, and another interesting aspect of Zenodo is also that you can acknowledge um, project funding. So when you upload, upload your data or other research output, there is a metadata field called grants, and there you can enter your grant identifier. And then uh, OpenAir will let your funding agency know. So this is perhaps also a point where I should say that there is a human Zenodo curator behind it, and they uh, need to validate your upload. Um, so you may experience a small delay before your data are available in, uh, in OpenAir. Um, what I skipped on the previous slide is the so-called DOI versioning, and that was one of the most requested features um, for Zenodo. Um, it has been co-developed, and that is, I, I'm very pleased with that by the Zenodo team and the B2Share team together. Um, Zenodo and B2Share are built on the same digital repository platform. And um, DOI versioning is a valuable feature when you deposit, for instance, a major correction of uh, your data set or when you have a new wave. Wave is typically a term from uh, longitudinal research. Think, for instance, of um, surveys or measurements that are periodically repeated and that result in a new data set each time, then DOI versioning will give each new version a DOI, but also a DOI for the whole series, the family, you could say. So in a publication, it's up to you um, whether you cite the whole series or just a particular version. And another feature in Zenodo is that it makes software preservation also very easy. 
um, when you have code on GitHub, um, then it's very easy to forward it to Zenodo. I see there is a question in the chat box if there's a study measuring the fairness of Zenodo. Yeah, we'll try to find the link to a study that 4TU did when measuring fairness of a couple of repositories, and I think Zenodo was in their sample. Um, so yeah, there are indications for measuring fairness. Okay, we have now seen a couple of services um, from both projects and um, the projects that went before um, that aim to help you to deliver fair data at the end of the research cycle. And of course, the end of your research cycle is the beginning of a new cycle. But let's take a minute to talk about data management planning. Um, so I'm sure you all know about the need for data management planning and you know that funders and universities increasingly demand that you deliver a data management plan, that there are tens and tens of DMP templates around. Um, other webinars have already dealt with what should be addressed in the plan, but my focus here is on two services that you could use for drafting the plan. And on the left hand, you see the well-known DMP online tool provided by the Digital Curation uh, Center. And on the right-hand side, you see the not very well-known um, Easy DMP tool. And that was an initiative by EUDATS and OpenAir. Um, and it will become part of the EOS Cup service portfolio. Now you can see from both my um, screenshots that you can register to both the tools and explore the Horizon 2020 template, and not surprisingly, the structure of those templates is identical in both tools. Yes, there are similarities, clearly, um, apart from both providing this particular template. Both tools allow you to uh, invite others to work on your DMP or to give feedback on it so that the DMP under construction, um, you can uh, collaborate on a particular plan. Of course, you can export your DMP and both tools um, plan also to support machine actionable DMPs. Um, very briefly, machine actionable DMPs refer to the situation where uh, it's possible to automatically extract information from a, D, uh, a DMP, which is, for instance, relevant for funders who want to uh, collate all the answers to question 12, or uh, it will be interesting for um, checking how far the plan has already been implemented, and so on. Uh, and apart from the similarities, there are, of course, differences. This new um, Easy DMP tool, for instance, provides uh, another kind of guidance to the questions in the template. It is a more free interpretation of the text that the commission wrote, and that might help you to understand what kind of information the template asks for. The DCC DMP online tool, um, on the other hand, um, follows the EC guidance text more strictly, more closely. Um, but there you have the option to also get the expert guidance from the DCC itself, which uh, is also very helpful. And um, Easy DMP is also not so literal in another sense. They, uh, it tries to minimize the number of free text fields, and that means uh, it provides more pull-down menus. And that can be very helpful if you want to select a particular metadata schema um, or a particular file formats that you plan to deliver. Here's another intermezzo, um, but still I think it is very relevant. Um, when you demonstrate in your grant proposal, so not in your DMP, but in your grant proposal, a good and a concrete awareness of how to make your data open and fair, this may increase your chances at winning the grant. And we are very thankful um, that Ivo Grigorov, the grant support officer, reminded us of a publication that's also mentioned on the slide. And he also found us some quotes from actual feedback on grant proposals. Um, because there are indications that grant proposals 
receive pra praise for including an outline of a data management plan, um, even although a DMP is not required in Horizon at the proposal stage and is not part of the uh, formal review in the sense that um, the data management section in the grant proposal um, is part of the competition between grant proposals, so to speak. So you see some nice anonymized quotes um, that Evo found us. For instance, uh, a clear description in this particular proposal is provided of how core data sets and model development can be shared broadly with the scientific community. Data storage and accessibility issues are not considered sufficiently. Good realization of the commercial potential, data management plan, and so on. So the lesson you might want to draw from this is that ideally already in your grant proposal, you should describe how open and fair data will result from your project. To conclude, as Alan said before, this is a subset of services, um, services that can help researchers to put the fair data principles into practice. Clearly, in your own research domain, in your own research infrastructure, there may be very relevant and valuable data services, um, which we now bluntly and uh, blatantly ignored. Um, so we are aware that we address just a very small part of what gradually will become a huge open science cloud. And um, although we tried to map services to um, the research data lifecycle and to fair, the lines you see here um, are only indications. They're not exhaustive. It's not really possible to link a specific service to a specific fair principle or part of that. But um, we hope you see this webinar as an invitation to take a look at these and similar services. As we are in the business of reuse, we did also um, yeah, there's an echo now. Uh, we also reuse slides from several colleagues, um, and that really brings us to the end of the presentation. So, how are we with questions? Okay, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Alan, for this very uh, very useful webinar. Um, Actually, to be honest, there were not many questions that have not been answered yet by some very helpful colleagues in the chat already. So special thanks for Sarah Jones and Mark van der Zanden from, uh, from EOSC, Sarah Jones from DCC, to reply to a couple of questions that have been asked. But just for completeness uh, sake, I will, I will paste all the, the remarks and questions that have been asked uh, in, into this field so that you just that you can all see them in case you were not uh, you were not following. If you just bear with me for a second, I will, I will paste them. Um, so if you if you go up to the top, um, the first thing that that I just made a note of is that there will be an evaluation form sent out. This is not uh, relevant to the contents of the webinar. Um, so uh, the first one was the, the question whether uh, DCC is a part of the EOSC hub. So uh, Sarah Jones answered that with um, uh, just the EOSC pilot. Uh, then there was a, quite a conversation going on about how to know which data standards are relevant and uh, if there are more than if it's possible to have one, one more than one relevant standard uh, for a certain discipline. So there are quite some comments in the chat about that, but I don't know maybe Marianne or Alan, you want to uh, elaborate elaborate a bit if you if you once you've read through, uh, through all the answers. Well, I will. Um, I also see the notion of fair metrics. I think that is an interesting question. Um, I'll copy two links in the chat box, uh, which you can check if you want to know more about measuring the fairness of uh, of uh, existing data. So the fair, I think Xiao um, asked about fair metrics. And as far as I know, fair metrics do not yet 
address the fairness of ontologies, and that's also in line with what Sean answered. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Um, the next question is um, a question about the marketplace of uh, EOSC. Uh, question by Sarah Jones. I see Mark has already uh, replied to a couple of questions uh, to the question of Sarah. I don't know if any, you want to add anything there. And now no? we're also in the chat. It's okay, the so I hope, I hope the the, uh, Sarah, the answer is uh, is clear. Uh, then there was a question that has not received an answer by Sean as to uh, whether Indigo services will also appear in the marketplace. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to answer to that in the chat or, or if uh, Mayan or Ellen, you have a, you know about that? Uh, this would typically be the question that we would hope uh, that Mark van der Sande would answer. We didn't introduce Mark, but he. Uh, um, we asked him to be our backup, so to speak, when we would get hard questions about EOS have related. Martin, uh, Mark, I will, I will make you a moderator. Normally, you should be able to start your broadcast now. Currently. Hello? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, for for having services uh, listed within uh, within the marketplace, within the service catalog also for USCAP, uh, we are working on uh, rules of participation, and that means that uh, what is required, what do we request from service providers to have services being listed in the service catalog and in the marketplace. Uh, we will come with a number of uh, mandatory requirements and some optional requirements uh, on uh, how the services should be described, promoted, uh, how access can be provided to the service, uh, what type of support channels will be available uh, to uh, to ask questions or report issues with the service uh, and on the maturity of the, of the service itself. Um, and then we have procedures for applying for requesting a listing of services within uh, the marketplace to provide services within the context of ESCAP through the app. Uh, and we also were going to work on uh, processes for assessing those, uh, those uh, services which have applied for, for listing. Uh, it will be uh, a broad process. Uh, in principle, any service providers could be uh, apply, going to apply uh, for listing within the service catalog uh, and the marketplace. Um, so it goes beyond as only uh, the services which are listed uh, or for service providers parting, participating within the ESCAP project. But uh, for assessing and evaluating the rules of participation, we first look at service providers which are active uh, within the project itself uh, before we promote uh, the rules of participation externally. I see also a question from Sean. Will there be EOSC approved software? Uh, within this, we are looking at different levels of rules of participation uh, by uh, having services just having a listed uh, listing within the service catalog and the marketplace towards uh, services are more integrated within the infrastructure, more leveraging of uh, core services provided by uh, infrastructure service providers as EGI and EUDAT. Then we uh, increase the uh, the level of mandatory requirements to enable access and promotion of services via the uh, marketplace and service catalog, because there is also more reliance of the service on backend services provided via the hub. Um, then it is more on the level of how far are you integrated and making use of EOS hub uh, uh, services. I'm not sure if we will go to a brand of. ESC approved software or services. 
Uh, there's also, at the moment, we focus more on services. Services is something different as software. Services are, of course, built on top of software, making use of software, but it is a whole process and uh, an organization behind in providing the service. It's not just software. Uh, if a service is available as uh, a software package, of course, it can be also uh, described as part of the service, that the service is also available as a package which you can use to install a local instance, but that will be go via other uh, channels to provide us. If, you, if there are any questions, please put in uh, information in the chat. I can respond on this. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for this. Um, there is a there is a question uh, that just popped up in the chat by now about the cooperation agreement between Open Air Advance and EOS Pilot. Not sure if any of you can can answer uh, can answer on that that one right now. Okay, so Marian says there's already a formal collaboration agreement. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything. Yes, online. there's a formal collaboration agreement between Open Air. Um, Okay, so um, um, it might be worth it to explain the difference again between EOSCOP and EOSCOP Pilot or just maybe link to a, to a online space where there's more explanation on that, if that's available. Um, yeah, maybe a few words on ESC pilot. So the word pilot in the name of the project already suggests that it is, a, um, let's say, a forerunner of the other. So it immediately, it, it started earlier. Um, it started, I think, in early 2015. Um, and it is piloting several things, so several concepts, also on governing large infrastructures and so on, also in training, January 2017, thank you. Um, also in um, looking at uh, the skills and capacity needs to really use uh, and, and benefit from something as huge and ambitious as an EOSC. Um, it's a two-year project. and. Um, fortunately, there is a good overlap in time between EOSC Pilot still running this full year 2018 and EOSC Hub and, and Open Air Advance that both started January um, 2018. So yes, it can be confusing because we overlap in time. Um, what is very beneficial is that we to some extent also overlap um, in the sense of a personal union, so several organizations and individuals collaborate in more than one of these projects. So the idea um, is that um, the, the insights and the agreements and the stakeholders and so on that were more or less collected already in EOSC pilot will carry over to the other EOSC building projects. Um, so this is really intended um, to, to stimulate continuity of expertise and networks, technical networks, but also mainly people networks. Um, shall we then move on to the question that's now on top of what's on the screen? About yes. measuring the fairness of Shimodo. Mm -hmm. So Sarah already added the link to uh, a paper that's uh, measured. Uh, the fairness of a couple of repositories, and the interesting thing, and you can compare it to the to fair metrics links that I put in the chat box. Of course, everyone's exploring. No one has a clear definition of what fair exactly is. So we are all exploring and um, sharing ideas with others. So, do you think these are good metrics? Do you think these are relevant parameters? Do you think these are good scales or degrees and what have you? So. Um, there are no final answers to um, 
the fairness of a service or a data set, but gradually we're moving towards consensus, I hope. Okay. So I'm not sure if you can hear me. Okay, very good. Yeah. I think if there's one last question then that is about the, the uh, services and providers registered uh, into the ESC. Uh, into ESC. So maybe uh, I'm, I've seen there already Mark and, and, and then some others have already chipped in there. I don't know if there's anything additional that you want to say on that subject. No, I think it's pretty clear what was what's said in the in the chat. So there's one last question popping up now into the um, from Irina Novak into the chat. Uh, hold on. So it's by Irina as well. It disappeared. Yeah. When, when you start a new Horizon 2020 project and you're preparing your DMP, uh, can you already rely on the services that are mentioned into this presentation? Are they better versions or are they uh, fully in production? Um, sorry, Gwen, I missed the question. Can you put it on screen again? Can you see this now? So somebody asking, yeah, okay. So the question is, I think in summary, can the services that you presented into this presentation, can it already be used or are they mostly in beta? Uh, no, most services are already in production. And uh, Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding for EOSC Hub is it is about service integration, not so much about service development. So all services that want to be part of EOSC Hub already need to have a very robust level. So you can use them uh, and trust that they will do what they promise to do. And I think the technical term was a TLR, TLR9, so that is a, uh, a level of um, uh, um, what's the word? Sean, help me here. Um, the technical readiness levels. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Technology readiness level. Okay. Okay. Um, I see it's two o'clock, and as we said, we would clock off at, at one hour. I think we are. Uh, this is would be the time to close off this this uh, webinar. Um, as I've announced before, the recordings and the presentation will be made available as soon as possible, which will be probably a bit later today or or, or else uh, tomorrow. Um, you'll be able to follow. I mean, they will appear on the open air um, webinar page. In any case, uh, the link I shared at the beginning. Uh, and um, I would really like to thank uh, Alan and and uh, Marianne for uh, for this presenting, and uh, also to Mark from EOSC uh, EOSC Hub to to chip in with with some very valuable comments and remarks. Uh, and uh, I, I sincerely hope that we can uh, do this exercise again. I hope you all enjoyed this webinar. Uh, can I ask you one thing? Um, we, we do want to improve our webinar services, not, on, not only on technical level, but especially on, on level of contents. And so we have made a, an evaluation form for you to fill in. Uh, it, it only takes one minute of your time, and it just it would be very useful for you if you could if you could uh, take the trouble to just uh, to follow uh, follow the link and fill it in. Uh, and like I said, you will be receiving uh, recordings and presentations shortly. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Gwen.
um, for presenting, uh, for helping us present, for hosting this webinar, and um, as usual, um, but not as usual, for collaborating um, between the two projects. Thanks.